Here's to Ukraine. And so I want to invite them. Oh, there we go. Get loud. Um, I want to invite them to come up and share with the church. Tell us what you're doing. Tell us what God's doing. And then um, preach to us. Does that sound good? And you have, you know, you have, take, take your time. You know, 1130 is fine. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh -huh. Pastor. I'm going to move this pulpit forward because I, I told my kids this morning, you know what's going to happen is I'm going to knock these trees over there. <laughs> <laughs> We're so happy to be here. It's been a few years. Uh, we came out maybe four or five years ago before we left um, when Pastor Andrew's dad was on staff. And you were here maybe like two weeks. I mean, you guys had just come here. So um, it's been really cool to stay connected over Facebook while we've been on the other side of the world and see this church transition into new leadership, and we're super excited about what God is doing here and in Madison, as well as in Ukraine. So, um, just by way of introduction, I'll tell you uh, all of our names, and then hand the mic over to Jeremy. We'll kind of go back and forth here and fill you in on on life in Ukraine. Um, but my name is Wendy. I grew up in the Milwaukee area. I grew up in an Assemblies of God church, very much like this one. Um, Knew, I knew when I was about eight years old that God had called me into missions. And so um, since I've been a small child, I felt God's call on my heart and on my life. And um, it took a little while and a, and a long journey, but we finally ended up being able to serve overseas. Our oldest daughter is Theodora. She's 13. She um, also feels called into missions. She wants to serve as a pediatric doctor in Africa or to underprivileged kids. So she is excited about um, that path that she feels God's called her to. Um, and then Tobin is 12. We don't quite have Irish twins, but we were almost there. So that was an exciting time. Um, so uh, he is a typical 12-year-old, you know, video games. I, I, I told uh, my sister-in-law this morning, I said, I don't even really know what goes on in Tobin's world anymore. We've just gotten to that point. But thank God that I have a techie husband that does. So he keeps the parental controls tweaked and, and Tobin is 12. <laughs> um, but his dream is to help us with the kids' ministry and the church plan that we're going to do. So we're excited to have these two awesome team members on board. And then our third one is downstairs. She's nine. Um, her name is actually Russian. We named her here. She was born down at Freighter to Milwaukee, and we had no idea when she was born that we'd be headed to this area of the world. So God has a sense of humor, and um, we're just thrilled that he's called each one of us to different things and that we can work together as a family. I'm Jeremy, uh, and my calling is different than Wendy and the kids. Uh, God didn't call me at a young age. He called me when I was well into my 30s. Um, I was actually working on a PhD program in mathematics at UW-Milwaukee at the time. Um, and sometimes when he says that God called me out of darkness, like math is darkness. And, <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, that's kind of my brief background. Uh, I'm a math nerd, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about Ukraine. That's a little more interesting anyway. So on the next slide, you'll see a picture of the continent of Europe. If you're like me, I get lost so easily, it's silly. Um, so I have to start with something I've seen before. I've seen this picture before. I can recognize it. The boot of Italy it kind of stands out. But Ukraine is the pink country on the far right. And on the next slide, you'll see a zoom in of the country of Ukraine. <coughs> Ukraine is a really cool place. Uh, first of all, it's the largest geographic country in the continent of Europe. So that's kind of cool. Um, and it has everything. It's got big cities like Kiev with over 4 million people. It's got tiny little villages where people are living like it was 100 years ago, where they're still milking cows by hand, they're drawing water out of wells, um, they don't have electricity or cars. So it's, it's really like turning back the clock in a lot of the villages in Ukraine. Uh, as far as the land features are concerned, they've got mountains, they've got forests, they've got farmland. They've got even this little tiny, like five square mile desert in the middle of Ukraine. So any kind of landscape you like, Ukraine has it. Uh, it's got a big river running through the middle and you see on the southern region there, uh, it's actually up against the Black Sea. Uh, while we were in Ukraine, we started our term in the north in the capital city of Kiev and we spent one year there. We did language acquisition. We still are not done acquiring Russian. 
Uh, it's a very difficult language if you've not looked at it before. Um, and then after one year, God gave us an opportunity to move down to the city of Odessa, which is right on the Black Sea. And we see that as being where God is going to bring us back as well, and we'll share more as we go. So a lot of people ask us, how did you wind up leaving Kiev and then and landing down in Odessa? On the next slide, you'll see a picture of the national church we attend. Um, the pastor of this church invited us to leave Kiev and come down to Odessa. So now we are the only um, Assemblies of God missionaries down in Odessa. There's a few, literally like a few other families from America as missionaries from different other fellowships and denominations. And um, we have just been so, so blessed to be a part of this church. Uh, I am guessing that several of you in here understand our position, where you're the foreigner, and the church comes alongside you and helps you out with language stuff and legal stuff, and that's exactly what this church did for us. So um, whenever we got into a car accident, they showed up. Uh, whenever, you know, someone tried to... <laughs> Someone stole our license plates and asked for a bribe. They helped us print out new ones. They were just such a blessing to have. And we're just so thrilled um, to be a part of this church. This church was key in opening up two big doors in our first term. Now, if you were here last time, you know we went to do church planting. And we knew we needed you know, some time to learn and then go ahead and do that. So this last term was about that sitting, um, acquiring language, figuring out the culture so that we could go back and church plant. But in the first term, God opened up two big doors, like I said a second ago. And the first one was our Veterans of War Reassimilation Ministries that we were able to launch with cooperation of that national church. So the situation in Ukraine is this. There is a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. Now, I've seen an article that they had a meeting last week that Russia and Ukraine have finally sat down, and they haven't in years, to discuss a ceasefire and putting all this to bed. So we're optimistic that God will bring peace to this area of the world. But in the meantime, there's been a war going on, and people have been dying on a daily basis. We get notifications on almost a daily basis of a, a, a sniper that's killed someone and whatever. Um, we have well over 13,000 deaths in the last five years that are both civilian and soldiers. And um, the situation in Ukraine is that the military does not pay most of the people that are serving. So what that means is you buy your own uniform, you buy your own food, you buy your own gun, you buy your own ammo, and if you're the captain or the leader of a battalion, you are responsible for whether or not those men and women are fed and taken care of and so on. There's no VA, there's no benefits to families if something should happen, and so what's been happening is the government, the local government has come to that church and said, can you help us because our people are coming back from fighting and they cannot get reassimilated into civilian life, their families are torn apart, they have this you know, messy psychiatric piece, which PTSD is brand new to the Ukrainian culture. Um, so we were able to contact a person in the United States that we have worked with out of Springfield and I, I told my friend about what was going on, and he is in charge of a ministry called uh, Warrior's Journey here in the United States. And I said, so can we get some stuff to bring it over here and translate it and work on a discipleship program for our veterans of war? And he said, when you listen, God spoke to us earlier, and we felt the Holy Spirit impress upon us that we need to translate our curriculum into Russian earlier. And we went ahead and did it, not knowing at all if we were going to be able to use it or how we were going to use it. So here you are in December. This was two years ago, almost to the day. Two years ago. Here you are calling me on December 20th. And I have a meeting the first week in January where leadership is asking me, what are you going to do with this stuff? What are you going to do with this translated project? And now I'm able to walk into that meeting and say that we have this opportunity in Odessa. So how many of you think that that's awesome, that God had the answer before we even knew that we needed it? And so we're, we praise God for that big open door. When we were flying back in May, literally while we were on the plane, our national leaders from that church were in training to roll out their chaplaincy program to minister to veterans of war. So that national church that you see up here is going to take that program, which is just, you know, on the next slide by representation. 
and go way above and beyond what two middle-aged math professor, preacher girl, people could ever do. You see, God did not give us some special in with the military piece, but he asked us to obey him. We moved to Odessa, and then he used us to connect the dots and connect people so that this ministry could take place. Not because we're great, but because he's great. The second big door, and we can move on to the next slide and then the following, is special touch of Ukraine. I don't know if, if Charlie Trivers has been here recently, but Special Touch is a ministry here in Wisconsin, and, and nationally actually, where people with special needs or disabilities are ministered to. And so Charlie and Debbie, who are the national directors, actually live in Wakaka, they came to Ukraine about a year ago and drove through the country with us in our Speed the Light vehicle um, and saw the needs in Ukraine. And uh, it's, it's like rolling back the clock, I don't know, maybe four, I don't know how many generations ago, where when a baby is born, now in Ukraine, um, it's automatically institutionalized if that child has a disability or a special need. Um, the idea of autism is brand new to the culture of Ukraine. And so again, we have this big gap where we've enjoyed perks here in the West and some progress that they're not seeing until right now. So you may think, how could you institutionalize your little baby? You know, don't they love their children? Well, of course they do. But as Jeremy explained, if you're milking cows by hand and there's no electricity, do you think there's a hospital? No. There's no therapist office. There's no clinic. There's nothing that they have access to, as we saw as we drove throughout the, the country. So right now, Ukraine is working very hard on catching up with other areas of the world where there are services for people with disabilities. And we are so thrilled to have special touch um, kind of guide us in this process. So we'll bring Char Charlie and Debbie back to Ukraine after we get settled and we return. Charlie will teach at the seminary level to our pastors and teach them the theology of disability ministry, meaning every person is created in the image of God. And each one of us has something special to offer, whether we perceive that in someone else or not. We're all gifted and we all have something to contribute as the body of Christ. And so we're so thrilled about that opportunity, too, in Ukraine. So God opened up two big doors above and beyond what Jeremy and I could have done in our human flesh and was able to move some things in Ukraine and get help over there um, while we were learning language. And we're just so thrilled about what God has done in our first term. Yeah, so that's a pretty good summary of what we did in our three years in Ukraine. And now we want to kind of transition and talk about what we see God giving us as a vision for our next term. So I mentioned that we had two years in Odessa and we're planning to return to Odessa. And on the next slide, you'll see kind of a visual representation of Odessa. Odessa is a city of one million people. And as Wendy mentioned earlier, we're the only AG missionaries in that city of a million people. It is a very international city. Tons of people from all over the globe come to Odessa for a variety of reasons. Many of them are students, but some are also in government work and other fields as well. Um, we see the largest pockets of people coming from China, India, and Turkey. But there are also countries that are from uh, Africa that are represented there. There are also Middle Eastern countries. There are also other former Soviet countries, all congregated in Odessa. And we feel God leading us to minister to these internationals. And so we recognize, having been internationals now ourselves, some of the needs that they have, like feeling alone or even having a language barrier if they didn't learn Russian before they arrived, which we know that very well. Um, and so briefly on the next slide, we feel that God is leading us to begin an international church in Odessa, Ukraine. So we'll just kind of go through the next few slides quickly and explain to you after some praying and wise counsel, what we feel God is leading us to do. So when you plant a church or you revitalize a church or you kind of refocus what you're doing, you ask yourself, what do you have to offer and what is the need in the community you're reaching? So what is the need for internationals? It's community. We need a place to connect. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir in a couple of cases here today because I think we're planting your church in Odessa. Um, so, you know, um, as a new person, how many of you in here have moved to a different city or a different country? And you know what it's like to kind of feel out of place initially, right? 
So we need people to help us find the right grocery store. We need people to help us find services that we can understand in our own language. Um, place people in places that won't rip us off, that won't sell us, uh, you know, and legal help and all those things that you need as a foreigner. And we want to provide that through an international community. And how can we meet that need? We are going to start a hub, kind of, so to speak, like, and then each one of these things will be spokes off of here. But the idea is for community in the middle. And the first piece we're going to develop is a multicultural center. So as Wendy mentioned, there will be many spokes off of this multicultural center. And the first one that we see as a really easy fit for our skills is an American University Prep Center. I still have that PhD in math sitting in my back pocket, and I'm willing to use it for God's glory, right? Even though it came from darkness, <laughs> it can be used for good. Um, but a lot of internationals, they, they actually are dreaming of being students at an American university, either in the States or abroad. And so a lot of times they don't know what's required in order to get into one of these American universities. So I can help them with things that for Americans seem kind of, you know, normal, like SATs and ACTs. Um, and maybe CLEP test prep, if they want to get a few classes under their belt. Uh, there's another exam that's very important for college students called the TOEFL exam, which basically just demonstrates that you know enough English to be able to take college level classes in English. Um, so those are things that we can obviously help with in addition to tutoring and other forms of educational assistance. Uh, another layer of this multicultural center is going to be language clubs. So we can easily start an English-speaking club for people who want to brush up on their English or develop their English more. And also we'll plan to start a Russian language club for people who maybe came from another country and don't know Russian, which is the local language of Odessa. And we will be sitting in that class and learning, by the way. We will not be leading that particular class. <laughs> yes, we'll have to get our Ukrainian friends to help us. It's interesting because God has already lined up several people that have been willing to help us out. Some are early in their journey in Christ. Others have been going to church for years. And we're super excited about the team he's bringing together. Um, the next thing that we'll work on after we are able to attract some students is to work on the Alpha course. And what that would look like is we'll have a meal at our house or at our, our cultural center, depending on if we can get a place rented and, and how much all that is. And we will go through the Alpha course, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a 13-week it's a study. Um, and it goes from the point of maybe God exists, I don't know who he is to me, if he does exist, to a point of decision and commitment in Christ. And so we want to walk through that every week, do another topic, and invite people into relationship with Christ. And then when they've accepted Christ as their Savior, we would love to do one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And so you see, kind of everything will begin to fit together so that we accomplish our goal of community through corporate worship, like what we're doing here this morning. So the question that we're hoping that you're wondering at this moment is, how can you get involved? So fast forward a slide or two. How can you get involved? There are three ways to get involved. And I want to first of all thank you as a church for being involved in at least two of these ways already. So first of all, the first thing we absolutely need and cannot do without is prayer partnership. We need your prayers desperately. So if you do nothing else, please visit our table and make sure you get one of our prayer cards. Now, if you were here a few years ago when we were here, we had these super nerdy triangle uh, prayer cards, kind of going off that math professor theme that we had going. Um, these are not current. Uh, the picture is very old. So please pick up a new prayer card, and I'll, I'll challenge you the same way a friend of ours challenged his congregation a couple months ago. He said, grab one of these prayer cards and either put it on your fridge or in your Bible, whichever one you open the most. So I'll just pass that on to you. Um, the other way that you can uh, partner with us is financially. And again, your church has been very faithful in partnering with us financially, and we thank you. We could not go to Ukraine and do what we're doing without churches like yours partnering with us. So thank you very, very much. I will say our budget has gone up, um, which I'm sure is no surprise. You know, we're starting a brand new ministry. 
that has expenses and there's cost of living increases as well. So if you wanted to prayerfully consider increasing your support, we certainly would welcome that as well. Um, the third way that you can partner with us is a really fun idea, and that is to become a team member. We mentioned that there's five of us Osbournes. We are the full Assemblies of God crew in Odessa, a city of a million people. And we know for a fact we cannot do it all ourselves. So if you wanted to get a group together and come out for a missions trip to Odessa for a couple of weeks, or maybe God is asking you personally to come out for something more, like a year or two, or anything in between, please talk to us afterward. We'd be happy to talk with you about that possibility. Yeah, so any other questions you have, you know, come and see us at the table, um, visit with us following the service, and we'll be happy to answer any other questions or give you information, whatever you need. Um, I just want to invite you to, to connect with us over Facebook. We're able to keep in touch with a lot of people that way if you're on Facebook, like our page, hunt us down. Um, if we recognize your face, we will accept a friend request. We're really, you know, try to live our lives publicly as ministers of the gospel, and um, we're just excited to be connected with people in this way. I don't know how missionaries did it, honestly, a decade ago or so. We love being connected with our partnering churches and our partners. Um, this morning, I just want to move into a time of um, sharing a message that God has given me, and we just have a few minutes left here in our service this morning, but I want to share out of Matthew 5, 13 through 16, about how God can work even in the middle and out of hardships. So we'll look at Matthew 5, 13 through 16 in a minute. Um, but, you know, people have asked us, how was your first term? How did it go? And at that moment in time, we have a decision in how we respond because our time was filled with amazing new experiences and painful rejection. And we had tons of open doors and we struggled with loneliness. And we had great new friendships. We told you about a few of those. And we definitely felt satanic spiritual warfare. We felt God's anointing on us for a few special moments and projects that we did. And we also felt exhausted. And then when we were exhausted, we felt God's supernatural strength kind of carrying us through. And then we faced new challenges. So you see, moving from Wisconsin to Ukraine didn't change anything. Life is life, wherever we are. We are. You know, I think sometimes people think missionaries grow wings and put on halos and whatever. And, and we even found when we landed in Ukraine, we still brought us with. And um, <laughs> life was still difficult and awesome all at the same time. So God was with us in every moment, and that's the bottom line here. And we're so thrilled about how we can testify about that. Jeremy told me once uh, when we were preparing, before we even left Ukraine, talking about you know, what message God was giving us to share and whatever. He said, if he could, he would rewrite Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul's talking about he was shipwrecked, he was left for dead, he was eaten by dogs, you know, and he made that part up. But, you know, when he's listing his hardships, Jeremy said, and our version might sound something like this, we've been in two major back-to-back -back traffic accidents in Ukraine, we've been threatened by dangerous people, we've been under surveillance, our license plates have been stolen for bribery, We've paid tickets that were assigned to us unjustly. We've been rejected and mocked for our calling and vision. We've lived in a dangerous situation. We've been sidelined and underutilized. We've been traumatized while ministering to those who've suffered trauma. We've toughed it out with difficult people. We've lived under martial law. We had a child hit by a car. We've been pickpocketed and our children have been mistreated. But God was with us in every single moment. And as a matter of fact, in some of those most difficult times is when he shone the brightest in our lives, in us and through us. And so, you see, life is a mixture of exhilaration and deep loss and everything in between. But the one thing we have constantly is the presence of Christ in our lives. And what's the reason Christ came? He came to reconcile and to redeem. He came to be a light in dark places. So even though I don't have time to get into each and every one of those stories, several of them are quite funny, actually, in hindsight. They were stressful in the moment. Um, but I do want to share on how we can shine, show, and share the gospel, and how that often happens in dark places and hard moments in life. So let's look at Matthew 
chapter 5, and we'll move down to 13 and 16 in a moment. If you look at Matthew 5, you'll notice from the pattern of probably what your Bible app or your Bible has written, we start with the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes were a global message for anyone in earshot. As a matter of fact, the group that was sitting there listening was an international group. Um, they were from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, the region across Jordan, and even if we put those on a map right now, they kind of look close to one another. This was camel foot walking times. This was an international group. These were people who were not connected to one another. So we can accept that what was spoken at the beginning of chapter 5 is a universal message for anyone, including us today. Our text, however, in verses 13 through 16, is a word from Christ, and it has specific and personal application. So Christ moves from earlier in the chapter speaking to everyone to kind of turning and speaking to his inward group, his disciples, his ministers in training, his church planters he was mentoring, and he shifts his attention there and speaks into this context. So he's talking to us now, the church. He ends the Beatitudes in verse 11 with a warning that difficulties and undeserved hardships are to be expected in the Christian life. Did you hear that? I don't know where we got confused in church. I grew up in church. I feel like I have, I can say this, that, you know, we think that we accept Christ and then it's going to be unicorns and rainbows and all the wonderful things that life has to offer. But into every life, a little rain must fall. There's difficulty and hardship that's a part of everyone's life whether we are serving Christ or not, and that's what I want to address this morning. So it's into the context where he doesn't say, if hardships come your way, but when you find yourself in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of hardship, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And this is what we're going to focus on for the remainder of the time we have this morning. Verse 16. In the same way as that city on a hill has salt, as light, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize as human beings that we walked in here with different things on our hearts and our minds this morning, God. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate for each person in here seeking you, God, whatever it is that you want to say, God. Be glorified this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. Number one, let your light shine before men. When the Bible says to let shine here. This is a progressive, continuous thing. I think sometimes when we think about light, we think about switches, turning things on and then off. We think about matches, lighting up and then burning out. We light our candles at home. There's a beginning and an end. But this kind of uh, usage of letting something shine is without limit. It's continuous. It goes on and on. So we are to continuously be sharing the gospel with other people. This is a light that's not given for our good, but it's given for the good of others that are watching our lives, that are seeing us live our life. The word here, shine, is probably not even the best translation of that word, because a better translation would be the word radiate. So what do we think of when we say radiate? There's two big things that come up every time. I'm a former teacher, so you can talk to me. What do we think of when we think radiate? What is that? Radiate. A radiator, okay. Radiating. What about the sun? The sun is radiating. That means for us, in our human perception, and I know that people like Jeremy have calculated that the sun will burn out in 17 bazillion years. I just, of course, that's not a number. Even I know that, Jeremy. Um, we know that the sun has an end logically, but for us, how we see it is it's been there since we've been teeny tiny and our first memories are sparked in our head to the day that we die. The radiation of the sun goes on and on and on and we can rely on it. We don't even think about it. We just know that morning will come, 
and night will come, and morning will come, and night will come. The other thing we often think of in our area of the world is Chernobyl, when we talk about radiation. Again, those effects of radiation are seen on and on and on into the next generation. As a matter of fact, a lot of our disabled people were in the belly of their mothers when Chernobyl happened, and now they're institutionalized because of their disabilities. So you see radiation, or shining in this case, has the idea of going on and on, out beyond the source of light, but affecting the things that it touches as it goes. The word before here, to let our light shine, continuously going on and on and on, before other people, is a, an intentional phrase here. So we're placed strategically as lights in the world. We're to go forward in the most open and conspicuous manner and share the word of light and life, and that's the good news of the gospel. I picked a, a lighthouse in Odessa to illustrate this. You guys know the function of a lighthouse. We don't live far from Lake Michigan. I'm sure you've been there a time or two. It's to keep the perspective for the people in the middle of a storm or in the middle of the night, and that's our function is to let our lights shine before other people. Number two, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works. And Pastor already touched on this this morning. I think I caught wind that you preached on this last time. Um, so we did not coordinate this if, if we're hitting the same spot again. That just means we're going to hear it again, right? So we're supposed to let our lights shine so that everything we do Everything we do is preaching the gospel. Everything we do. And this is the evidence of our good works. The word good here, kalos in Greek, means attractively good. Good that inspires or motivates others to embrace what is lovely and beautiful and praiseworthy. The word good here is not simply okay or good enough. I saw a commercial recently, and maybe you'll remember this one with me, where a man is laying in the hospital and his doctor walks in saying, oh, I just got my... You know, my, uh, my license back, you know, and the patient's like freaking out. And the point of the commercial was like, good enough is not good enough. Yeah. You need to have someone who knows what they're doing. And that's kind of the idea here, is it's not just okay, but it's excellent. The good we are doing is to be so wonderful that it wins other people to Christ, that it appeals to other people, that it causes other people to ask the question, why are you doing what you're doing? You don't know how many times people said, why did you leave America to come to a country that's in war? Why did you take your kids who have everything at their fingertips in America and bring them here where we have nothing? Why is the question you want to be asked? Our works here are defined as tasks, employment, actions, something that's produced out of work and effort. So in other words, it's anything that's intentional. It's anything that requires action, intentional behavior, and has a tangible result. Some examples I think of are getting dressed. You don't just magically show up this morning and say, oh, how did that happen? Look, I got my clothes on, my glasses are clean, and my teeth are brushed. I didn't even notice. No, you set an alarm, you wake yourself up extra early, maybe, um, and you get ready on purpose. And so that's how we should be living our lives as Christians, as we do things on purpose, with a purpose. Um, when I go home today, those dishes aren't going to just magically be done that we left in the sink this morning after breakfast. It requires a plan. It requires intentionality. James 2.26 says that faith without works is dead. So we can be as moral as we want to be as individuals, and we can wrap it up in Christian wrapping paper, and we can call it faith, but faith without works is dead. Faith that does not result in fruit is null and void. So are we actively living our faith, or is it just something we label ourselves with or call ourselves? Number three, we need to bring glory to God. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and third, glorify your Father in heaven. When we shine and show others the gospel in tangible ways, we're then positioned to share others with Christ. This is a great season to do that. You don't even have to do a lot of planning. You can just say, Merry Christmas, or God bless you this Christmas, and that will catch people's attention every now and again. When the gospel has been shown, it illuminates the minds of people, it convicts their heart of their need for God, and then we can point the way to Christ. Glory 
glory here means to render or esteem glorious. It means to give glory, honor, or bestow, bestow glory upon the correct person. We're pointing to God because anything we do is out of him who lives in us. So we need to give credit to God for why we do what we do, and this gives us a place to share the gospel. I think we confuse this with strategies. We say, oh, well, I didn't go to Bible college, so you know, that's, that's pastor's job to tell people about Jesus. I mean, I'll be a good person, but I'll bring the church so pastor can tell <laughs> you. Look, you don't need to go to Bible college. You don't need to go through an evangelism program. You don't need any of that. You just need to share your story in the context of your place in that story. So let's not get confused. Let's not call it evangelism. Let's not say, oh, that's for sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so to do. I'm really not gifted. It's not a gift. It's an assignment. It's nothing special for any one of us. It's for each and every one of us. That's all we need to know to be commissioned. 1 Peter 3.15 says, be ready. That's a command to give an answer for the hope that's within you. 1 John 4.19 says, we love, we do things out of love, because he first loved us. So we're motivated to share out of the love we've received, being compelled to share that same love with other people. So, in closing, let me ask you this. What is your story? What, what has been happening in your life? What is the beautifully messy place that's hard for you? Because that's where your faith was born or is growing significantly. We're not growing muscles basking in the sunshine at a mountaintop experience. We're looking out enjoying the view, saying, thank you, Jesus, for this blessing in my life. Where muscles are grown and where work is done is when we're in the valley and coming up out of the valley. The uniqueness of your story will be able to touch people's hearts that no one else can. I shared last time that we had lost a baby, uh, our very first child, even before Theodora. And because we walked through that very dark season in our lives, that has opened up the door for so much ministry to people who've lost a close family member. Not even just babies or children, but even those who, who've had a significant loss in their life. So, it's the uniqueness of our story that is going to touch other people's hearts and lives. When someone comes to me with a cancer diagnosis, I can pray for them, I can relate with them, but I've never walked through that. It's going to be the person who's walked through that valley that can touch the other one's heart. I think sometimes we get confused and we say, um, God is putting me through this because, you know what, maybe God isn't even putting you through anything. Darkness comes, hard times come in our lives. Whether we deserve them, whether we earn them, whether it's a consequence or not, things happen sometimes. And it's in that place that God will build us so that he will redeem our story for someone else. That's why we answered God's call to move to Ukraine and why we're returning. That's why each one of us is called to shine, to show, and to share God's love with other people. That's why we're doing things that are uncomfortable. I'll tell you, as two professional communicators, walking into a country not knowing the language is incredibly uncomfortable. Not knowing what's going on most of the time is very uncomfortable. It's nerve-wracking. It's stressful. But I'm betting when Christ put his spirit into a, into a human body, sent him via baby Jesus to this crazy world, I don't think that was comfortable for God. You know, as humans can be quite barbaric, and the Bible records a lot of really grotesque, weird things. And I don't know if God was exactly comfortable sending his son to us to take care of. I don't think Jesus was comfortable hanging on the cross and dying for our sins. And so I think sometimes God calls us to places of discomfort in order that his, his light can shine the brightest in that space in our timelines. We're each called to shine, show, and share. We're called to shine in dark places. We're called to show God's love, and we're called to share his story. Us overseas, right now here in Wisconsin, just like you, you here, no matter where we're at, we are called to shine into darkness. So we invite you to do the same thing where God has placed you as we're trying to do in Ukraine. 
Because as we said last time, if God can use our family of five twitchy, quirky people, he can use anyone. Because he knows what he's doing. If he can use us to bring a military program into Ukraine, a faith-based reentry program, or a disability ministry into Ukraine, he can use you. None of us are too small or too insignificant for the task. So let's share the gospel together. Let's fill the world with God's love and let's shine in dark places. Thank you so much. <laughs>